this tutorial is about indirect and direct democracy and, and should uh, give you the tools you need to distinguish between the two forms. Uh, I'm going to begin sort of with the understanding, presenting some words on the significance of voting, and I'll also cover some methods of direct democracy that can be integrated into even an indirect democracy as a special element of governance, if you will. Uh, we're talking now uh, in the democratic steering chain, if you will, about the relationship between the people and the legislature mostly. But also indirect uh, di democracy in presidential systems would include the people voting for the executive and appointing someone to hold that office. Now indirect democracy, this is also known as representative democracy. Uh, and most entrenched democracies today are indirect democracies. That's basically to the extent that um, there is something of a synonym between saying this country is a democracy, it also means it's an indirect democracy. And of course, the most uh, direct way to be involved is to vote. Now, the right to vote is has not always been fully inclusive. Some groups have been marginalized, and this is true in most entrenched democracies, that at the beginning of, of development towards democracy, some groups were excluded, uh, most famously uh, the women. And uh, originally it was also about you know, property demand. So if you were a working class man, you didn't have enough money, you were not eligible to vote in most uh, countries. But suffrage then, granting the right to vote, was gradually more and more inclusive. More and more groups uh, were included and given the right to vote. So today, most political systems really rely on, on citizens choosing someone to represent them in uh, decision-making arenas, uh, rather than citizens making, making those political decisions themselves. We appoint people to run government for us. That's basically how it works these days. Now, this voting that will occur in constituencies, candidates will run in writings uh, or constituencies, depending on what uh, nomenclature you use. And they are territorial areas where a politician is chosen through the electoral process. And exactly how that happens depends on the electoral system of the country. Now setting boundaries for these writings, these particular areas, that has been controversial in the past. In many countries, politicians try to draw the boundaries for writings so that they would be guaranteed to win, because they knew that they would have support if you drew the writing in a particular fashion. Most countries have assigned the drawing of boundaries to an unpartisan uh, public agency that will be under the auspices of parliament, so that no one political party can decide how to draw those boundaries. But there are still countries where that doesn't happen. So, for instance, in the United States, gerrymandering, as it's called, is still something that politicians can affect a lot. And it's a very controversial topic in that country. That is something to pay attention to. Who decides where the boundary for the writing is drawn? Now, apathy is also something to pay attention to in any democracy, and it's the cause of low voter, voter turnout, uh, which is a phenomenon that we've been seeing all across the democratic world over the past few decades. The challenge here is to make that voters feel that it's meaningful to vote, that they have a voice, and that what they do at the, the ballot box matters. Uh, some systems have made voting the law. So this is Australia really has uh, is the prime example of compulsory voting. It's illegal to not vote in Australia on election day. Thus, Australia has a very, very high voter turnout. There are a lot of arguments against compulsory voting, for instance, that people should have the freedom not to vote if they don't want to. And that's a conversation that's ongoing in, in a lot of countries as well, among at least uh, people who are interested in politics. Direct democracy, that's a political system where uh, citizens are directly involved in the decision-making process. So instead of voting for someone to go to parliament and make those decisions for us, the citizens simply eliminate that um, uh, go between step and make, it, uh, make the decisions themselves. It's rare 
to find direct i couldn't say that any country today would be a direct democracy because it's or organizationally and functionally difficult to have everyone involved in the process now sometimes these tools can increase voter turnout in in, in direct democracies they can galvanize voters around particular hot button issues and the degree to which direct democracy would be a solution to democracy's ailment in uh, in democracy's problems in in most countries uh, can really be discussed there are a lot of people who have a faith in de direct democracy being superior to indirect democracy but there is also a lot of issues with it now let's go over a few instruments of direct democracy that can be used in indirect democracies uh, first of all you can have the powers of appointment so you can recall people, hold representatives accountable between elections. So citizens can then go and make a petition to remove an MP from office. And uh, that taps into the trustee relationship between the MP and constituents. So you can have a petition and if at least 25% of the voters sign it, uh, you might get the MP removed and you have to have a new election there. Uh, you could have a referendum, which goes much way beyond simply a writing. The, 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 it could be national or it could be municipal and so on and so forth uh, on a particular issue that has been uh, galvanizing citizens a lot. Uh, this is a way for government to allow the citizens to make the decision yes or no on an issue directly. Uh, there are a couple of examples of that. Quebec secession referendum, uh, where the vote to stay in Canada past just squeezed by so Quebec did not secede this was in the mid 90s Brexit of course is a much more current example and a highly controversial one and it illustrates some of the problems with the referenda is the uh, are the issues clear to the voters does the yes or no vote uh, is it clear are these clearly defined what kind of a Brexit did voters really want and the discussions in media about whether there should be a second Brexit referendum illustrates the problems of the first referendum quite well. And so the issue that the referendum was set to resolve hasn't really been resolved, given how, uh, how much controversy there still is around this topic. Policy making power, you can allow citizens to not just say yes or no to a particular issue, but to actually make the proposals and write the policy themselves. This gives citizens policy formulating power, unlike in referenda where they can't tell you what the alternatives that you're going to vote for. So in this case, it's decision making power in referenda. You have a yes or no vote, but you can't decide what the yes or the no means. So one could conceive of public deliberations as a way to, I guess, solve the Brexit issue. Citizens would then give direct input on policymaking through consultations. You can have public forums, you can have citizen assemblies, you can have this type of uh, engagement where you go out and you ask people, what do you really want? Uh, make the proposal, uh, make it comprehensive so that everybody understands what, what it is you want to achieve so that we can write it into some form of policy. It's a very long process and it's very resource demanding because you need to get people out. You need to uh, make sure that people understand the issue they're going to talk about. Uh, and you need to make the agenda move along so it doesn't get stuck in endless discussions where people are repeating the same points. But when it succeeds, it can increase transparency and it can also cre increase legitimacy. That means that people feel that they have buy-in, that they're part of the process, that they can affect the process and that their voices are really being heard. Now, it happens on local level in uh, quite a few of the Commonwealth countries, the UK, Canada, and New Zealand and Australia. You can find these in citizen forums, on, on, uh, certainly on local level, when uh, major issues occur. For instance, in Canada, there were quite a few public engagements in, in British Columbia concerning whether uh, the province would switch from one electoral system to another. And those public deliberations preceded a referendum on that issue. Now, there are problems with direct democracy. First of all, who gets involved? If you have a public deliberation, who actually comes to the town hall to talk about these issues? Uh, and often it's going to be those who are already interested in an issue or who are already immediately affected. 
So it really depends on what time you have to make it. If Are you planning it on a weekend? Uh, are you planning it on a weeknight? Who has access to the place? Some people can't get away on weekends because they're working. Uh, some people can't get away on a weeknight because they have to prepare the kids' meals for tomorrow and it's school day. Some people just don't care about the issue and don't think it affects them, even though it might be affecting them. How would you get, say, a climate change skeptic to turn up to a public deliberation about the effects of climate change? You're probably going to have a difficult time in doing that. How familiar are you with an issue if you've never heard of... If you don't know anything about the internal functions of the EU, uh, how are you going to be able to be part of a public deliberation on how to reform the EU? Should those who are not vocal be excluded? Uh, if someone is sitting there in a public deliberation and being quiet all the time, the, that person's voice has not been heard. Maybe that person has a lot to contribute with, just doesn't like to speak in public, and so on. And even beyond that, uh, so direct democracy here then doesn't necessarily solve the problem of having increased a fair number of voices into the conversation. Uh, it might just result in the people who are really extroverted and really passionate about an issue getting control over the issue over a majority of silent people. That's something that can happen. Uh, which doesn't mean that direct democracy will always be a bad thing. It just means that when designing direct democracy, the people who are structuring the process must, must think about these things. Otherwise, uh, the, the outcome will be skewed. But also, even if you get the process right, you have to think about, is the majority always right? There was a referendum on banning the building of minarets in Switzerland, and it passed. So that is now illegal in Switzerland. But uh, you can rightly ask if you should vote on an issue like that in a referendum. In Canada, it would hardly have been passed because there is the Constitution, the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. That kind of vote would probably violate the Constitution uh, because uh, there are strong minority rights enshrined into the Canadian Constitution. So basically, you don't vote on human rights. You don't vote, you don't set up a a uh, referendum on whether a majority has the right to infringe on the human rights of the minority. And also uh, the problem when you set up a process where the direct democracy looks uh, genuine but the final decision discounts, uh, dismisses all the consultation and they go ahead and make the decision anyway. Uh, this is currently a discussion in Canada regarding the building of pipelines and um, indigenous land rights in relation to that. There's a discussion on uh, whether the federal government is using consultation appropriately or whether they pretend to consult with indigenous populations and then may go ahead and make their decision anyway. And how much input should the indigenous communities have on the building of pipelines? So this that conversation is directly uh, an uh, issue of whether the engagement is genuine and substantive and fair. And uh, those are questions that uh, anyone who designs a direct democracy process and public consultation and deliberation process have to keep in mind. And that's an overview on uh, indirect democracy and direct democracy and voting and problems of uh, direct democracy.